Okay, good evening and welcome. Welcome to the 2023 Naturally Speaking series live from the floor at the Virginia Living Museum in Newport News. I'm Rebecca Kleinhampel, Executive Director at the museum. This presentation this evening is being recorded. And if you are in the Zoom audience this evening, you can ask a question on the question box. If you see a question in that box, you can upvote it with your thumb button. And we will hold questions for the presenter until the end. Uh, tonight, we're here to learn about animal behaviors, uh, specifically those of the bottlenose dolphins in Charleston, South Carolina. Megan Gallopo is joining us this evening. She is an educator and a research uh, scientist at the South Carolina Aquarium. She studies the distribution and behavior of the Atlantic bottlenose dolphin. And Megan and her team recently discovered a novel feeding pattern uh, in the Charleston Harbor. And uh, it is an adaptation to the presence of us humans. So Megan was raised in New York and studied uh, biology at the State University of New York, and then uh, achieved her master's degree in biological sciences from the Florida Atlantic University. Megan, come on up and join us. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me tonight and hello to everyone in Zoom world as well. Okay. Um, I'm like, like Rebecca said, I'm here to talk a little bit about bottlenose dolphins in Charleston. And um, I have a couple of the people on my research team, including Dr. Patricia Fair, who's actually a, the principal investigator and PhD of the team. And I'm a co-investigator, Elena Robertson and Hannah Baker, who I've worked with for many years. So I'm excited to be speaking on behalf of our team tonight. Let's see. One second. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about my background. And actually, before I do that, let me tell you a little bit about what I'm going to tell you tonight. I'm going to go through a, li a little bit about me and my work in Charleston. And then to, before we get into the feeding behavior that we've kind of figured out in Charleston with our dolphins, I, I want to talk about adaptive feeding strategies in general with bottlenose dolphins because they're really diverse around the world. And then we'll finish up with what, what, the specific behavior that we've seen in Charleston. So I, I got my undergraduate degree in biology, um, as Rebecca said, and then I went on to work with dolphins under human care. And that was the beginning of my career. And you can see here with some of my most special dolphins um, working with them. And at this facility called Dolphins Plus Marine Mammal Responder, which is in the Florida Keys, I was a trainer and I did all aspects of animal care and husbandry. I also did education and public interactions and I uh, got to participate in behavioral research. So some of that was training, most of it was observational research. And I really learned so much about dolphin behavior and about behavioral research by doing this work. So it was set the foundation for my future career. Then I went on to do wild dolphin studies um, and I worked with, I went to, for my master's and that was at Florida Atlantic University in Boca Raton, Florida. And I worked with the wild dolphin project and we studied Atlantic spotted dolphins pictured here in the Bahamas. So we had permits in the Bahamas that allowed us to enter the water with the dolphins, which are not so easy to come by here in the United States. And we uh, non-invasively and non-intrusively um, photographed and video, videoed the dolphins. And I studied their behavior. I studied maternal behavior and alloparenting in Atlantic spotted dolphins there. And it was just as beautiful as this picture. It's beautiful. Then I moved to Charleston and I started working with a research team that I'm currently a part of um, and been able to participate in some health assessment studies. That's me in the white hat holding, um, assisting in adult wild dolphin release and doing some photo ID here. And this is the team that I've been a part of for almost 10 years now, working with the dolphins in the Charleston Harbor. I'll talk a little bit more about them. I've been able to do that. Uh, as a part of a as a staff member at the South Carolina Aquarium as well, and at the South Carolina Aquarium, I am an educator and the volunteer and teen programs manager. So I get to do a lot of guest interaction, working on the floor with with guests and doing multiple different programs. But I do um, also get to oversee our volunteer program with our education volunteers and um, and and work with our team programs as well. So I'm really proud to be a part of that team and very lucky that I get to do two things that I'm really passionate about working with dolphins and research, but also education, which I am extremely passionate about. So I'm very lucky I get to do a lot of different things. So let's talk about what we do in Charleston. 
So the dolphins in Charleston are Atlantic bottlenose dolphins, and this is a, um, a population that has been the subject of long-term monitoring and health assessment research si since the 90s. I've been a part of the research team here for about 10 years in Charleston, but it's been going on long before I got there. And um, this, this, like I said, this has been the, the subject of long-term studies. And that has included uh, Charleston Dolphin health assessments, and that's a comprehensive dolphin screening health assessments where we actually capture a wild dolphin, bring them up onto the boat, and do a full physical exam on them. Um, and we've done that in Charleston, South Carolina, as well as in conjunction with other facilities in the Indian River Lagoon, Florida. So in this project has been going on for many years, and in that time, about 360 dolphins were captured, given a full physical exam, and then released. So during when we have a dolphin up on the boat, as you can see here, we have a variety of medical professionals in the marine mammal world that are um, making sure that dolphin's okay, but really giving them a full physical exam, figuring, getting every amount of information we can get from that animal, every sample that you can get, and make sure, you know, under, try to get a real close look at those animals. And um, the research team that has led this study with Dr. Patricia Fair have had over 100 publications as a result of those studies in that time. I was lucky to be a part of that as well towards the tail end. So what I do the most of is photo identification studies. So that's me there on the boat taking photographs of our dolphins, a little more non-invasive study method in which we um, recognize individual dolphins by dorsal fins. So we're lucky that bottlenose dolphins have real distinctive dorsal fins that allow us to individually identify the animals. And being able to track animals over time by, as an individuals allows us to measure things like the, like life history and all other aspects of dolphin behavior, abundance and distribution. What we found or what has been found is that we have long-term residents there that show high site fidelity, which is a fancy way of saying there's a lot of dolphins that live there all the time. And they seem to, they're residential to the population. So it, in Charleston, we have between 300 and 900 individual animals based on the time of year. That 300 is kind of that base residential population that's there year round. They, they really like that area. And then we have seasonal residents and we have transients, animals that are moving up and down the East Coast probably stopping in Virginia and coming back down to Charleston all over. So when we're out there, we're taking pictures of those animals to track individuals and track the movement of the animals, the distribution of the animals. You can see that cute little baby dolphin face that I put up there for your viewing pleasure and mine. Um, but that's not actually what we really wanna see. We wanna see a picture like this, which is uh, what we usually go for, which is a dorsal fin. And you can see how this is an example of a distinctive dorsal fin. You can see that real specific notch there. And I'm not sure if you can see closely, but there is also a freeze brand scar on that animal as well as a result of a health assessment collection. So an animal like this, we've gotten a real close look at the health of that animal and also been able to look at their abundance, their distribution, where have they been their whole life? So really getting a very comprehensive look at our bottlenose dolphin population. So most recently, the most recent study that I've been a part of has been the part of Charleston Harbor Deepening Project. So if any of you have been to Charleston before, you may know that we do have multiple terminals and Charleston along with Savannah is one of the 10 top busiest ports in the United States. So we have several terminals where shipping, shipping vessels come in from all over the world and this harbor deepening project would allow the dredging of the shipping channels, as you can see, up to 52 to 54 feet. This is really important from an economic standpoint, as many of you may be familiar with the fact that the Panama Canal widened, larger and larger ships coming through to keep up with the global economy. They, did, they needed to be able to accommodate those really large ships coming through. So deepening the harbor was an important aspect of that. Um, that, but that dredging activity did take place in what is known long-term dolphin habitat, including the Charleston Harbor and the Cooper and Wando Rivers, which are attached to the attached to the harbor. And I'll show you a map. So in this picture here, you can see the Charleston Peninsula, which is that little part in the middle there, and the that's where most of like downtown Charleston, if you ever visited Charleston, you probably saw the best of Charleston, which is downtown and the Charleston or the South Carolina Aquarium is on that southeastern side of that. So in that top map, what you're looking at is the likelihood of us, us seeing a dolphin in there. So the darker red is increasing the likelihood of an animal being there. And you can see those dark red spots kind of where we see the highest likelihood of seeing dolphins consistently. And then in that bottom map, we've removed anything that's not likelihood of 80% or less. So in the bottom map, you again, see those hot spots uh, where we're 80% to 95% likely to see a dolphin. So we identified those as hot spots where we very consistently see dolphin activity. Realize that that's, that's really some of the long-term dolphin habitat that we were able to identify. 
And that's also where the dredging was happening. So if you look here with that same map, you can see the Charleston Peninsula, you can see those same dark red spots where those multiple, you know, multiple hot spots where we see dolphins year round. And then this is overlaid with the, the dredging footprint. So you can see the opening to the harbor there and, you know, from the Atlantic Ocean where ships come in from overseas and they come right through those hot spots coming up into the rivers. And again, some of those terminals are right at hot spots. So we really needed to understand what kind of effect on the dolphins this anthropogenic disturbance was going to have, if any. So there are there is research that has shown that residential population dolphins have been displaced by dredging projects. And there's research that has shown dolphins populations have not been dis, dis, moved by, displaced by it. So we've just finished collecting data on this. So if you ask me, well, what happened? Did they go? I can't tell you the real full answer yet because I don't. we don't have all of that data analyzed yet. But we did see what you see in this picture, which is a lot of coexistence of the dredging. You know, These dolphins are pretty used to the presence of humans in the harbor and they kind of went on their daily lives while major dredging project went on. We collected pre-dredging data, um, during dredging data and post-dredging data. We just completed that. But what did we find when we were out there? Well, when we were out there, we would often see dolphins by the boat. So we would be going by these terminals, those hot spots that we talked about. And we would always find ourselves saying, oh, there's a ship dock. There's going to be a dolphin there. And after a lot of saying this, well, we were like, hold on a second. Why is that? Well, you know, what are they doing over there? You know, we're scientists. We shouldn't just be like, oh, yeah, they're always there. Let's figure this out. So upon further examination, we realized the dolphins were feeding. So you can see in that picture there at the very tip of that dolphin's rostrum is a mullet. And that red background is the side of the container ship. So what we realized is that dolphins were barrier feeding by the ships. And barrier feeding is exactly what it sounds like, where dolphins use a barrier to trap fish. They chase fish up against any kind of barrier, and, and it makes it easier to catch it. So what we were able to identify was a new adaptive feeding strategy. Now, barrier feeding is not new. We, there's a lot of examples of that one I'm going to talk about, but it's never been documented on a commercial shipping vessel like that, which is pretty interesting. So and, and adaptive feeding strategies in, in, in general are pretty cool. But what the heck does that mean? I want to back it up a little bit. We're going to back up. We talk about, before we jump into that, let's talk about what are adaptive feeding strategies. Adaptive feeding strategies have been documented for many years with bottlenose dolphins. And bottlenose dolphins are known for their plasticity in feeding tactics. And that's the adaptability of an organism plasticity to change in it to its environment between, or even between habitats are able to adapt very easily. And bottlenose dolphins are known for being extremely adaptive. They're also known for being a cosmopolitan species, which means they're found in many habitats. So bottlenose dolphins are found in oceans all around the world, almost every ocean. And even within every ocean, they're found in different habitats within the ocean, deep water, coastal water, inshore, they're everywhere. So that really allows populations of dolphins and individuals within those populations to exploit certain features of their habitats. So who does this? Why does this? Why do they do this, right? Who's doing it? Does every dolphin do something different? Do they all do the same thing in different places? What does all of this mean? There's a lot of factors that influence the emergence of adaptive behaviors, one of them being social structure. So again, some, there are some species of cetaceans that are very solitary and some that are always living in big groups, but bottlenose dolphins, they can do a little bit of anything. They can be in small groups, they can be in big groups, they can go from big group to small group. They, they're, they move around a lot. So if an animals are social versus solitary, that can impact the emergence of these behaviors. If there's a dominance hierarchy and some animals are losing out in competition for resources, some are more likely to be able to access different food sources than others, we could see that emergence of those unique behaviors. Phenotypes and abilities as a result of those phenotypes. And phenotype is a fancy way of saying what their body looks like. You know, there's genotypes, which we all learned about when we were in genetics class, where that's what our, our genes say. And the phenotype is how it's expressed or how they look, so or how their body is made. So some animals, because of how their body is made, may have certain abilities that allow them to do things others can't. So sometimes they're the best and they win and they get to all the, do all the cool stuff. Or sometimes they're the ones that are left with trying to figure out some other way to find food. Sex is really impactful on them. And if they're a male or female and male and females play very different roles in different populations and they have different energetic needs and that could influence if they are going to participate or develop a adaptive feeding strategy. 
prey species, what they're going for, and the availability of that prey species. All of these things could really impact the emergence of that behavior. So Australian Aboriginal groups, African countries have been, described, have been describing adaptive feeding behaviors since the 1800s. Not necessarily the same way we describe them now, you know, with fancy papers and lots of data, but these kind of things have been documented. So it's not really new. Dolphins have been doing these things for a long time. Um, and they're just, they continue to, to show us how cool they are. One of the, an interesting adaptive feeding strategy that has been documented is actually related to humans as well. And that's the artisanal mullet fishery in Laguna, Brazil. And if you've ever watched BBC, you may have seen this was really well documented. And if you Google mullet fishery in Brazil, you'll find some cool BBC footage where there's a small group of people, small part of the population, humans, that is, that do a special type of feeding where they throw cast nets to catch mullet. But the dolphins have learned that they're always there catching fish and they have started to interact with them. And they've kind of formed a symbiotic relationship, if you will, in that the dolphins will herd fish into the nets and that advantage and it helps the people, but it also, um, they also are at a advantage as well because they can get fish that are discarded. They're from the nets or the ones that are trapped up against the nets. So that's a very unique example and I wouldn't try it at home, but it seems to work for them in Brazil. Um, this is another really cool one called kerplunking, and that's an actual scientific word. Um, and this has been documented with bottlenose dolphins at Shark Bay, Australia. And Shark Bay, Australia um, has some incredible research that there's a long-term bottlenose dolphin population there as well. And a lot of what we know about bottlenose dolphins have come from the research there. But kerplunking is that picture right there where dolphins lift their, their flukes and their peduncle, which is their tail suck, out of the water and slam it down on the water and making a distinctive kerplunk sound as the researchers, according to the researchers. And that big slap on the water stunned and disoriented animals making, or excuse me, like the fish and made it easier for dolphins to catch them. This is sponging, and maybe some of you have heard of this before, because sponging is some, was some early evidence for tool use in dolphins. Tool use is always a hot topic in animals, and this is one of the first ones that was documented in dolphins, also out of Shark Bay, Australia. And in this population, you can see these dolphins, the, the individuals that did this actually pushed, had these sponges on their rostrum, and they, they, they're pretty sure what they did was use them to find food in the sediment underneath. So this may have given them an advantage of being able to root around better, like you and I are using a shovel. But another interesting um, hypothesis is there's a lot of venomous prey species in Australia, and that might protect them a little bit if they're rummaging around for the wrong animal, or maybe the one they want, but they don't want to get stung by it. So, and, and the really interesting about the, this population is that it's a small subset of the overall population that does the sponging, and it's only females. And there's also evidence for social transmission of the behavior where females are teaching their calves, but they're only teaching their female calves how to do it. Isn't that so cool? So, you know, we talked about those factors that influence it. So there's a lot to think about, like, why are females more, um, more likely to do this? Why then is it passed down? So it's a, this is a more solitary type of feeding behavior, but it's very specialized. This is called mud plume feeding, and you may have seen this on documentaries. I've seen some really good documentaries with the, this recently, and this is found on, this has been documented on the Florida Atlantic coast and in the Atlantic coast of the Keys. This is a more of a coordinated group hunting effort, and what the dolphins do is they swim in a circle. They herd up some fish, swim in a circle, and hit their flukes on the water, and as you can see, it's shallow water creating big mud plumes. It's almost like a mud net, and that, again, is disorienting, scaring the fish. You can see the fish are jumping out to the waiting mouths of the other dolphins. So very different from those other behaviors that we talked about where this real solitary, this is a coordinated group effort that involves planning and okay, you go here and I'll go here and we'll get all the fish. This one's really cool. This is called crater feeding. And I've actually gotten to see this one in person because this is happens in um, off the coast of the Bahamas, Atlantic bottlenose dolphins. There are also a population that live um, off Bah Little Bahama, our Grand Bahama Island on Little Bahama Bank, which is where I did my master's. I studied the spotted dolphins there, but there are also Atlantic bottlenose dolphins there. So what they did was they would swim and in with put face first into the ground, and they were foraging for animals underneath the sediment. So and they would go, we would see them go down to like their peck fins. This is the coolest thing. And as they got their food and swam away, it looked like a crater was left in the sand. Hence the name crater feeding. It was coined by those researchers. Again, so this is really 
again, a more solitary environment based on the, the prey that they're going for, which is underneath sand. Um, it has also been documented in other populations and called things like drilling, rooting, or drifting. And as you can see below, it's been documented in Florida um, and most recently in Barataria Bay in Louisiana. And that in, in that more shallow environment in Barataria Bay, that's a, you know, a coastal environment, they're not doing it at 30, 40, 50 feet underwater like these dolphins here. They're, the researchers noticed it because they had their flukes up out of the water and it looks like they're splashing all around. You see okay there? Now, Barataria Bay is also an area that was most heavily affected by the Deepwater Horizon spill. And um, so there's, there's problems with that. If they're in possibly ingesting sediment from that sand, they could be getting some of the contaminants associated with that oil spill. So another reason why it's important to understand why these behaviors are happening, because it will let us understand how the animals are being impacted by their environment. This is strand or, or beach feeding. This one is um, near and dear to our heart and any of those us from Charleston, um, because this is, happens a lot in Charleston. And you've probably seen it. It's been documented a lot, and it's been the subject of a lot of recent documentaries. So in strand feeding, those dolphins look like they're in distress, but they're not. They're actually, they actually create a big pressure wake and come up, slide up out of the water together, pushing fish out of the water. And then they grab all of those fish that are literally fish out of water and then they slide back into the, into the water. So this has been documented very at length in the Southeastern United States, in South Carolina and a couple other states, but, but beach feeding has also been documented in Australia and Ecuador. This is also a group coordinated hunting effort. And there are dolphins that do it individually, but studies have shown that there seems to be like a sweet spot of the number of dolphins that push water that can create the big enough wake when they do it together in a coordinated effort. So cool. And now that's a type of barrier feeding too, and the barrier being the sand, the beach. And barrier feeding, again, beach or strand feeding has been documented in many different countries and continents. And those are all natural surfaces that they've used as a barrier to catch the fish, but it has also been documented on non-natural surfaces like the nylon netting of fish farms in Italy, sea walls in Florida, which is what's pictured here. Um, you can see this dolphin pushing a fish that he caught up against the seawall and using it the same way they use the ships. And even boats, smaller recreational boats that are docked have also been, have also seen that kind of barrier feeding in Florida and in Brazil. So the, that brings us back to what we found, that barrier feeding. And I have a ship here, and this is one of the biggest ships to come to call our port. And to give you an idea of how big that is, if you see all those little squares on top of the ship, each one of those squares is the size of a Mack truck. And a ship like this can carry up to 15,000 of those containers. And so, and those ships are up to 1200 feet long. And, and that's just what we see on top there. So under the water, there's another 20 plus feet of boat under there. So it really does create a very significant sizable barrier for the dolphins to feed. And we have boats coming and going all of the time, always boats at, at, at port. So it, it really is a great spot for the dolphins to utilize those, that wall, that surface. And I wanna reiterate, those are, these are, dolphins are using these ships when they're docked. They're not when they're moving, they're when they're docked up at the terminal. So we observed this besides these docked commercial ships. And this was, you can see the dates there. It's a very small subset of data as part of a bigger project. You know, oftentimes in science, you're doing one thing and that's when you figure out something else really cool. So that was kind of here. So we have, a, it's a very small subset of data. We have a lot more work to do on it, but we were able to figure out a lot just in that small amount of time that we pulled out once we noticed this is something cool and something that's happening. And we coined the term ship side feeding because they were again using that. And we did find that this was not necessarily an example of coordinated group hunting. We would see multiple animals doing it at once, but they didn't appear to be coordinating with each other like animals when they strand feed all doing it together or mud plume hunting when everyone has a certain role. Um, they just seemed to be something that they were all taking it, often taking advantage of the same opportunities. And it was another adaptive strategy, but this time capitalizing specific on, specifically on human behavior and in what we call an urban estuary. So these animals are living in this very, you know, urbanized estuary, if you will, because there's a huge presence of humans, not just in our commercial shipping, but also in recreational vessels. And if anyone's been to Charleston, one of the best things to do is go out on, on the boat. And so there's a lot of boat traffic, a lot of human impact here. And the dolphins are taking advantage of it. They're pretty smart. 
So another thing that we observed here was that mothers and calves were often highly likely to be seen engaging in this feeding behavior. And in this picture here, you can see this mother dolphin with her calf, and that's a dolphin that we identified. You can see her two notches make her pretty easy to identify. And uh, we saw her doing it pretty, pretty regularly. So we were, again, the, the advantage of being able to know these animals kind of over long term, saying, okay, I know that one. I know she's here. She's got her calf here. So it's possible that females are more likely to do this in our population because they have an increased, they need to increase the efficiency of their foraging when they have higher caloric needs. And that would include times like when they're pregnant or when they're nursing or when they're pregnant and nursing. And as a mother of two, I can really relate to that. I was always really hungry. So you just got to make sure you're getting your food as quickly as possible. So much more work is needed to better understand this, you know, uh, to understand if it is more likely to be females, if, if there is that increased likelihood, if it's a lot of the same individuals, if everyone's doing that, if the female, if the animals that are doing it, are they forage, is this how they spend most of their time foraging or are they foraging in other ways? Some of the foraging techniques that we talked about before, studies have shown that those, that's the only way that they forage or the most, the way they do most of their foraging um, where, or are they just doing it whenever like, oh, there's a ship I'm swimming by, I'll try it. Or is this like, this is what I do all the time. We, we have a lot of questions we still need to answer and we're you know, excited to move forward and find some of those answers. So I wanna show you some cool pictures of them. And again, you can see that mullet coming out of the dolphin's mouth there. So really the dolphins would be feeding, like chasing a fish and really they just chase it either along the side or to the side of the ship. And when the fish have nowhere else to go, they go up and the dolphins usually catch them. Now, some dolphins are more dramatic than others, more theatrical than others like this one. This was that female that I showed you the picture of. Um, and uh, she would often jump right out of the water in dramatic dolphin fish catches. Um, this is a cool picture of a dolphin eating a catching a American eel off the side of one of the ships. And you can see that ship in the background there. American eels are not a typical part of a dolphin diet. Our stomach content analyses generally do not include, um, you know, stranding studies in South Carolina have in, not indicated American eel as a normal part of their diet. So to see one catching one like that, especially in that unique manner was really cool. So again, we get so much out of these learning about these studies, more about the dolphins in general. And here was another dramatic catch um, with this dolphin. And this time she was catching a needlefish, which is also not a typical part of their diet. And um, so it's not a typical part of their diet, but it definitely ate the needlefish that day. Needlefish seemed to be not the happiest needlefish. So I appreciate that you came here to listen to me talk about this tonight, but you might be, you know, might be wondering why do you care about any of this? You know, I, I'm in, I'm in a different state, different population. Like, why should you care about any of this? Great question. Dolphins are really cool. There's a lot of things I want you to understand about dolphins tonight, but if nothing else, remember that. Um, I mean, how cool are they? You know, the way that they've adapted. I mean, some of these behaviors that we talked about before are probably things that have come through evolution millions of years of, you know, dolphins way before we were around, they've developed these behaviors and passed them through generations. But there haven't been container ships around for millions of years. So this is a relatively new adaptation and how quickly relatively speaking, those dolphins have adapted to the changes in their environments. It's, it's just so cool. But it's also really important for us to understand the effects of human behavior on dolphin behavior. Again, these, these critical habitats and these urbanized estuaries, you know, there's an area, an area that we share with them. They're showing us they're not going anywhere. Obviously, we're not going anywhere. So we need to understand what's going on with these dolphins that's impacted by us humans. They tell us a lot about what's going on in our own backyard. As you can see from this picture in Charleston and probably here in Virginia as well, we are swimming in the same water the dolphins are swimming in. We're doing all sorts of kayaking, boating, paddle boarding. We're also fishing and eating fish out of the same water that they're eating, their fish. Um, so, you know, if something is negatively affecting dolphins, you can bet it's probably negatively affecting humans too. Dolphins are also really important because they're at the top of the food chain. So if something is happening to dolphins, it's happening to probably every trophic level below them. And guess who else is at the top of the food chain? People. So again, if it's happening to them, it's probably happening to us as well. So the better we understand that, the better we can take care of these animals, the environment that we share, but also ourselves. So what can we do now that we know that dolphins are cool and it's important to understand this? One of the things we can do 
are avoid certain contaminants that are found in dolphins. So these are polyfluoral alkyl substances and polychlorinated biphenyls. Now in some of those research, in some of that, uh, those captures we talked about in the health assessments, in the blubber samples, we found high levels, some of the highest levels in the world documented of these legacy chemicals. So these are chemicals that are found in food packaging materials, nonstick cookware, stain resistant carpet treatments, stain resistant couch treatments. Um, and sorry, and so those are things that are, we're finding these chemicals in dolphins. So we've got dolphins swimming around that are non, that are you know non-stick dolphins. It's not good for them, you know. Um, and if it's getting into their environment, it's getting into their food chain. It's definitely getting into ours too. You know, we ordered a couch years ago, and they said, "Do you want us to put a non -sta a stain resistant cover on it?" And I was like, "Definitely," you know, like a treatment. I was like, "I spill stuff all the time. Let's get that." Years later, now I understand this. I, you know, I know that there's horrible chemicals on there that my children and I are sitting on those couch and probably being impacted by those chemicals. And we can understand that better because we know that it's accumulating in dolphin blubber as well. So that's a that's a very broad statement. Just avoid these things. And you know, we always hear things like that, like you know what should I do to be healthier and keep the environment healthier? And, and sometimes that can be overwhelming and you're like, forget it. It's too scary and overwhelming, but there is one small thing. And that is this, this healthy living app that I've used ever since I've been a part of this team, um, environmental working group, healthy app, where it just allows you to, um, evaluate food and personal care items so that you are aware of what you're putting in your body. And that's really easy. You can scan stuff at the grocery store before you buy it. So it's one small thing you can do that helps keep yourself healthy and it makes it a little bit less overwhelming if you wanna be a little healthier, but that's something small that we can do to protect ourselves and the animals. And then also be a citizen scientist. So um, there, I know that this is not quite as, not right here, but this is just an example of a citizen science dolphin watch. We have one in Charleston too. Um, the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science has an app called Dolphin Watch. And here is a map of where we are right now. And you can see that there are dolphins right here in your own backyard, including one right there in Newport News. So that's a very simple, those are very simple apps that just, if you're out in the boat and you see a dolphin, you just click observe. If you're walking on the beach, you see a dolphin, you click observe. If you're, you know, on the pier, you can tell scientists exactly where you're seeing dolphins. And that just, you know, multiplies the, the awareness of where dolphins are and what kind of habitats they're using exponentially in a way that scientists that are limited by grants and things like that can't do. So being a citizen scientist and, in, and interacting with the new technology that way is a really, really awesome way to, to be a part of that and to help us progress science. And as you can see, there are dolphins right here. They're probably out there doing some cool feeding thing that, that no one hasn't published a paper on yet because, I mean, they're living in this really cool estuarine environment as well. I'm sure they're doing cool stuff out there too. And I'm sure those researchers are learning a lot about it and you can be a part of that as being a citizen scientist. Other ways to get involved is being dolphin smart. What I mean is that there are special laws that protect marine mammals in the United States. And the, they include S, staying at least 50 yards away from dolphins. And that's about 150 feet. Now, if you're out on the boat, if you're swimming in the ocean and you see a dolphin, there's nothing you wanna do more than like go up and look at that dolphin closer. But it's actually not a good idea to do that. It's illegal in the United States to approach a dolphin or marine mammal within 50 yards. So give them the space and observe them from a distance. Um, now, but I'm not saying the dolphins, if they approach you, you don't have to go running, screaming in the other direction. It's not illegal for them to approach you. But if you notice, if you're enjoying a dolphin in a non-invasive way and not breaking the law, but if they show signs of disturbance, move away from them. You know, if they seem to be showing signs of stress, slapping their tails, changing their behavior, hurting their calves away, that's your cue to move on. A is always put your engine in neutral when dolphins are around. Now we don't hear about, about dolphins boat strikes like you hear about with sea turtles and manatees because you think of dolphins as pretty quick and moving, but they are still susceptible to getting hit by a boat. So if there are dolphins nearby, put your engine in neutral to keep them safe. Refrain from feeding, touching, or swimming with wild dolphins. That's one of the most important parts of the Marine Mammal Protection Act. It's very tempting. Dolphins are the coolest, I know but we don't ever wanna to touch them or feed them. Not only is it not good for them, but it's also dangerous for us. They are large, powerful predators with 80 to 100 sharp teeth in their mouths. So it's important not to get your hands near those mouths. And teach others to be dolphin smart. Um, we have a harbor terrace at the South Carolina Aquarium and we see people breaking these rules all the time, unfortunately. And it's not because they're bad people, but they just don't even know those rules exist. They don't even know these laws exist. So the more that we can spread the word about how to safely interact or not interact with dolphins in the wild, teach other people to be dolphin smart. You're protecting yourself and you're protecting those animals. 
Finally, visit the Virginia Living Museum and other zoos and aquariums. Come see me at the South Carolina Aquarium. So the South Carolina Aquarium and, and encourage others to do the same. You know, the South Carolina Aquarium and the Virginia Living Museum, you know, and all of these other zoos and aquariums in the United States, these are all nonprofits. These are all institutions that are committed to conservation and to education. And when you walk in the door and you buy a ticket or you buy a membership, you're helping not only promote the conservation efforts and educational efforts, but you're also helping them care for the animals, all of the animals that live here that are ambassadors for the animals out in the wild. So I think you probably have all done that. Obviously you're a big part of a big part of the VLM. So you're doing it so, and, and tell people to do the same and tell them that just by walking into a zoo or aquarium or supporting their efforts, you're doing conservation. Again, conservation can seem scary and overwhelming, but, con but let them know that conservation is not only easy, but it's fun and it works, you know? And again, just walking into one of those places, learning about these animals, respect, and how we can, you know, and how we can share the environment with them is such an important thing to do and supporting the efforts of facilities like the Virginia Living Museum, you know, that's a great way to, to be an environmental and conservation steward. So thank you. Thank you so much for hosting me, the Virginia Living Museum. I want to say a special thanks to Rachel, uh, Deanna, and Bo for picking me up at the airport, everyone in the Education Department and Advancement Department who put this together, Virginia Health Services for sponsoring um, the event, for Jim Winepress and Azara Austin for hosting me. Um, and thank you again. Are there any questions? This picture gives you a good idea of the size of those ships too. And that's not a small dolphin. <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's a really good question. And I, I've never noticed them running into the ship. You know, not to say, I mean, they, you know, there could be a clumsy dolphin out there that runs into the ship, um, but I've never, they're usually really good at skimming across the water next to the ship, and I've never noticed them running into one um, or having scars associated with that, but that, you know, there are, there could be things like that that we just haven't, we can't see that close up. For example, you know, when we've done health assessments with dolphins in Charleston, you always can tell when you get a dolphin up on the boat who the strand feeders are because the right side of their jaw, their teeth are all worn down from those years of sliding up on the beach. But we would never know that if we didn't get a really close look at them. And there could be similar features in these guys that are ship side feeding, but we don't see that. Um, and it's, a, you know, these are ships that are pretty consistently moving. So there's not a lot of accumulation. I mean, there's probably a lot of algae accumulation, but there's nothing really hard, like no oysters or barnacles that are accumulating at the level that they're feeding at. So I don't think it would be too bad, but, but it, it's a possibility. It's a good question. I don't know for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question. And, it, you know, we, we don't have a hydrophone to hang over the side of the boat, but that would be really cool. And, you know, it's, it'd be interesting to look at the differences between the communication of animals that are cooperatively hunting versus solitary hunting. Um, and, you know, I don't really know. It is another interesting question in the same area would be how do they, how does it, inter their sonar, because they're using echolocation. Um, are, is it bouncing off the ship? Is that affecting the fish? Those are a lot of questions we don't know the answer to. Now, in the dredging study, we do work, we have worked with the University of South Carolina in Beaufort with a researcher named Dr. Eric Monti on the acoustics. Um, and we have um, underwater receiver located in different areas in Charleston to pick up on dolphin sounds and, and also understand how the, the loudness and the sounds of the commercial vessels and the dredging has impacted. Um, but I don't think it's it's not close enough when we haven't been able to get something right in the water like that. That's a really great question. That's one of those things that we would say in our further studies, we'd love to look at something just like that. So it's a great question. Yes. Geez, that's a really hard question. Um, you know, this might sound a little cliche, but 
they're just so smart, you know, and, you know, it's intelligence in animals is one of those things that is really hard to understand and to quantify because, you know, in the dolphin, you know, if you put a dolphin on land and said, answer the questions on this test, they would not do good. But if you put me in the water and they said, catch a bunch of fish, I would not do good. So who's smarter? You know, so it's hard to, it's hard to talk about intelligence, but they continue in the wild and under human care, they continuously blow my mind with how, with how intelligent they are and how unique an individual individuals are. And since I've had the opportunity to work up and close with individual animals, I've really gotten to see that they really do have different personalities, just like our pets at home. You, you have, you have two golden retrievers and they have such distinctive personalities. And I've gotten to see that. So even working in the wild, watching a group of dolphins swim by, I said, I need each one of them as an individual animal. And that's really cool. And I think that's one of the most exciting things. Also, I think I'm very impressed by how adaptable they are, you know, bottomless dolphins in particular, and how they're just found everywhere, but they're so different everywhere, and how they're just so tough. They're such an adaptable species because they're so tough, you know. Um, and I, I think that's what impresses me the most. Good question. Hard one. Oh, do I have a favorite? A favorite dolphin in this population? Um, you know, that dolphin that I there was a picture of her with the double notches. I feel a little partial to her because I've just watched her a lot and recorded a lot of data and she's had multiple calves and she's just a, a she's just a tough mama. And I appreciate that about her. And she really knows how to catch a fish and she's very dramatic about it. So I think she's one of my favorite. That's a good question. Yeah. That's a really good question. And it's not necessarily a sure thing. You know, I've seen a lot of dolphins miss, <laughs> you know, I've seen a lot of dolphins chase fish and then jump out of the water and there's nothing in their mouth, you know? And, and, uh, so, and so I think that, and, you know, we don't really know the answer to that. It has probably a lot to do with if, if there's evidence, which we don't have yet, but if there's evidence for social transmission, then obviously they'd be more likely to do something they learned from their mother. Um, and it also has to do with where they live. You know, we have animals that show really high sight fidelity. So, and others that don't. So some of them are just kind of, we have a high, a, a wider home range and some they're always in the same spot. So if it's not part of their normal spot, you know, it's just like if you stop at the same Starbucks every day on your way to work, you know, you're like, why isn't everybody going to that Starbucks? I'm like, well, it's really out of the way for me, you know, um, but it's right in my drive. So maybe it's more convenient for animals based on that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, like, and, and, you know, there's just so, so many, many factors that, and maybe there's, maybe those animals, maybe there's dominance. It, maybe some are saying, get out of here. This is my spot. I don't know all the answers, but, um, you know, and every animal is, is balancing an activity budget, you know, of how many calories they're going to expend catching their food versus how many calories they need, you know? So maybe one thing that's efficient for one group of animals, even in the same population, isn't efficient for another group. So there's, all, there's just so many, but, but that's great. And, and that's another thing we wanna figure out. You know, the animals that are doing it, are they only feeding that way? Or are they feeding that way 50% of the time and feeding another way 50% of the time? Or do they just do it once in a while? Are there some animals that do it all the time and some animals are just like, whatever, I'll try it, you know? So those are all really good questions we have to figure out. Great question, yeah. Go ahead, you like. Yeah, and I think that there's different amount of research on different groups. There's a lot of research on the strand feeding dolphins, and, and I'm not, I'm not. That's not my specific area of expertise, but I do know that it, there are a lot of the same animals doing that same behavior, and they're passing it down to their offspring. Um, so, and then and my, and there could be a lot of reasons why they're more likely to do that than others. Um, but I think I lot, forgot the rest of your question. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and you know, maybe 
maybe the prey that those dolphins are going for is very high energy. Like maybe it's a really nutritious fish. So they're willing to spend that extra energy and maybe a female that really needs those calories, for example, I don't know, that's, I'm not saying that's what happens there, but maybe they're more likely to do that because they're like, well, it's a lot of work, but I really need that. Um, and where other dolphins are like, I can go catch these fish over here and I don't, I'm not that worried about it, you know? So, so it, it, they're all kind of balancing their, their activity budget. And so when we're researching these things, you know, scientists, if you have the opportunity to really follow and hone in on those individuals, that's how you figure those answers out, you know? And so far we've kind of looked at it, we've kind of looked at it from like a really large point of view and next, our next steps, you know, is to get, in, get really into looking at those and answering those questions. Good question. Deanna? That's a great question. We're, our, of course, our hope is to expand further on that. It has a lot to do with grants and time and things like that. Um, and you know, we have about six year data set that our team has now started to analyze, but we're, but we're working with other groups to try and um, get, figure all of that out. And so that is definitely something we would like to do and like to learn more about. There's a lot of implications for further research and really cool questions and answers, hopefully, if we're able to do that. Um, what, was the sec what was the second part of your question? Was that it? Yes. Oh yeah. The other ports. Sorry. Yeah. And so I'm sure that this is happening other places. And you know, when, when we published that paper, there are a lot of ports in the United States and, and elsewhere. And I really hope to hear from other researchers, you know, to find out, did, have you seen this before? Um, especially in, in Galveston, Texas, there's a big shipping channel there, a big shipping, you know, port there with a very similar environment. And um, I've heard that they see something, they see things like that. And why wouldn't they? Of course, I'm sure it's happening elsewhere. Um, it's just a matter of people, if people have the means and ability to document it, you know, and in what way. So I, you know, when you send, when you, and, and I learned so much just publishing this paper and, you know, hopefully other people will, it might allow them to learn more about what's going on in their environment and publish from there too. So I, I'm sure it's happening elsewhere. And like I said, here in Virginia, there's probably cool stuff happening. You know, I, I, I know there's a port here and also the, you know, those big Navy ships as I was driving, you were driving me over the bridge. Actually, I was like, I wonder if they're doing it over there. They probably are. Good question. Yeah, that really varies with species, but it also varies within population. Um, and in this population that we, our dolphin population in Charleston, there's a, about a two year calving interval and it doesn't seem to be affected by sex of the, of the calf, but that may be different for other groups of bottlenose dolphins, you know? Um, there's a lot of studies on the social structure and how it's affected and how, how sex affects social structure. But in our population, we haven't, that has not really been documented, but um, you know, there's a, there's a lot, a lot of this, a really good question. And we, we don't seem to see that in our area, but it definitely has been observed elsewhere where, you know, female, where, you know, depending on what's going to happen next as a juvenile, they may spend more or less time with their mom, but also, you know, what's going on with that mom. If they, if they have, if they can't get pregnant or something, they may keep that calf longer with them, whether it's a male or a female. So again, there's just so many factors that, you know, that lead into that. I wish I knew more of the answers, but I don't. Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, well, we, we don't really know for sure if they're teaching their calves or we haven't really fully documented that yet. And we, so, so that's a different type of transmission. So there's social, there's vertical social transmission where they're teaching offspring. And then there's horizontal where they're like learning about it from peers. And I don't think that has been documented quite as much. Um, and and so I don't really know. That's a really good question. I don't think we, I think we're looking closer to see the mom and calf thing, because that seems like it makes more, a little bit more sense. So I've never, but, but then again, you know, if you see your friend doing something cool, you're like, I might want to try that, you know, but it's different than a teaching behavior. It's more observational. I don't know. It's a good question. Um, we haven't really observed that yet, but again, that's something that we want to find out next. Does anyone have a question? I do know the answer to <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But seriously, any other questions? Any questions online? Um, 
Oh, you mean like the ship side feeding in Savannah? I, I don't know. I haven't, I've, I'm not, I'm not really familiar with the research teams down there and, and if what they're working on and if they've seen it, but I would love to learn more if the opportunity arose, you know, that's one of those things we get the paper in circulation. We hope to, I sent it out to the ones I sent it to the research team in Galveston to say, Hey, do you guys see any of this? Um, but it, you know, I, I, I don't know too much about the population in Savannah to know if that's happening, but you know, my guess is that be, it probably would, if there's a residential population there, you know, there seem to, what we've seen is that they seem to figure out what works best for them wherever they are. So it would be surprising if they weren't, but I don't have any, I don't know anything about it. That's a good question. Thank you guys so much for having me tonight. Thank you for your time. Thank you in Zoom land to everyone as well. All right, Megan, thank you. Uh, always very happy to have a fellow AZA accredited professional um, so much synergies between what we do, obviously what you do, uh, come join us downstairs conservation command center opened, uh, before the holidays. And you'll see some of those citizens science projects that we do here in our area, like project feeder watch, like, um, frog watch. And we've got actually, uh, some microplastics in our lovingly named trash tank aquarium. So you can see the amount of plastics that are actually ingested. So a lot of synergies and we're, we will um, join you next month, February the 16th, something different. We're gonna be talking about inv invasive species, uh, in particular lionfish with a PBS Nova uh, special series called Ocean Invaders and the award-winning filmmaker, Jeff Bodeker. So again, thank you. Come visit the Virginia Living Museum, learn about more adaptive behaviors in the human brain in our Mazes and Brain Games exhibit opening Saturday. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next February on the 16th. Thank you.